But I am very excited to talk about investigative journalism, um, which is something we do uh, at the paper um, in many different ways. And um, you know, one of the other aspects of, of doing this kind of work is not just, as I said, dragging the, 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 the hidden things um, out into the light, but finding the, hidden, the open secrets, the things that are actually hiding in plain sight, that if only when you looked at the behaviors and the patterns, if you only knew how to work, how to look, it would, it would become clear. And I think Medicare Unmasked, which is the name of our project, um, is kind of both of those things. Um, the, the project goes back a few years. Uh, and a few different places I could start, but I'll start in 2009 when the Wall Street Journal editors and, and reporters um, sought data on claims that are filed to Medicare. So why would they want to look at Medicare? It's, um, it's, it's just one part of the healthcare system. But it's a very large and very important and very influential part of the system. It covers, at this point, about 50 million people. Um, it is, uh, uh, at this point, a $600 million budget being funded by all of our tax dollars. And it's, uh, in many ways, a window into the larger healthcare system. The, um, the policies, what they pay for Medicare, are to some extent mirrored in the public, private paying sector as well. So if we felt that if we could look at the claims, all of the things that doctors and hospitals and medical practices send into Medicare, and what, is, what they're being paid for will be a window into, into where there might be waste, fraud, abuse, or how are people being treated in America? Well, uh, we, we tried to get that through FOIA and it didn't work. So <clears throat> ultimately, what the journal did is work together with the Center for Public Integrity, another nonprofit journalism organization, and uh, purchased a, a broad set of data, the kind of data that is normally accessible only to academics. And we did a series of stories in 2010. They were great stories, we're very proud of them, and they were a finalist for a Pulitzer that year. But they, they couldn't do, we couldn't do everything we wanted to do. And one of the stumbling point was we couldn't name the doctors. You couldn't, you could talk, you could look at the patterns, you could see what kinds of treatments were, uh, were, were um, um, attracting a lot of dollars, but the doctors' names were suppressed. And that's because there was an injunction that uh, had been in place since the 70s that said that you couldn't that the doctor's needs were protected, that the public's right to know did not surpass the doctor's right to privacy. And it prevented us from doing a lot of the kinds of stories we wanted to do at that time. So when we finished that series, we decided to go after that. And we, the journal and lawyers intervened in this ongoing, this lengthy legal case, and um, fought, at this point, I'll just say it's a lengthy legal battle. <laughs> um, and that's what was 2013 in a federal appeals court struck down the injunction. <coughs> And that was a big deal. That meant not necessarily, though, that, um, is, is it still buzzing too much? No. <laughs> so it didn't mean that this data was suddenly going to be available to everybody. All it meant, really, is that it's subject to FOIA, Freedom of Information Act requests, which, of course, we and every other news organization immediately um, went for. But uh, in the spring of 2014, CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicare Services, actually uh, did something very proactive. And they, on their own, released a big chunk of this data, the very data that we had been seeking, the, the, the payments to doctors by name. So they released, um, all at once, a year's worth of payments to 880,000 doctors that bill Medicare, and naming all of them. It's a huge data set, and it came out all at once with very little notice, boom, we had, we had the data, or at least you know, a big chunk of the data that we've been looking for. And that was very exciting. And very daunting that came all at once, and everybody had it at this point. We didn't have any exclusive access to it. This was public data, but it was a big, big, big data set. Um, and we were actually very well prepared, very well positioned to do this because we had been we had been pursuing this data for a long time. So we, the reporters had already been doing the kind of work you need to do when you're looking at data because you need to look at more than just the numbers. So we had already been talking to experts, talking to ex officials in CMS about where to look. Um, so. We had a pretty good idea of where to start. Um, when you start with a big data set, you, you sort of look first for some of the big obvious kinds of patterns that you might look for. Who, who, who build the most? Who build the most? What specialty got the most? And we did a couple of very fast stories over the first couple of days, looking at um, just the biggest takeaway. One big takeaway, um, which may or may not surprise you, is that only 1% of doctors are responsible for 14% of the payments to Medicare. So there's a small sliver that are billing a lot. And, and this, this is something that's going to hold true throughout the whole series, that most doctors are not doing 
inappropriate billing. They're not doing things that are medically inappropriate or, or, or more for financial gain than they are for the patient's benefit. But there are, you know, providers. There are definitely a few where their patterns of billing are suspect. Um, can we, so after we did the first couple of stories, the second story that we did maybe was trying to look again at the numbers and be pointing out that just looking at the numbers doesn't tell you the whole story. Sometimes people um, bill, pay a lot of money because they've been doing a lot of one particular kind of thing and they're really good at it. So that's the person you want to go to. You want to go to the doctor who does the most knee surgeries when you need a knee surgery. So that doctor is going to have a lot of billings for knee surgery. Um, we, so we tried to point out a few um, um, qualifiers to the data, but then we stopped. And we said we can't just keep quickly doing you know, the obvious takeaway points. We need to now start digging deeper. So we took a pause and we decided to try to do not just the news stories but the deeper ones. And we took some time. We took and uh, broke up into various groups. We had um, healthcare industry reporters, we had uh, the um, investigative journalists, the traditional investigative journalists, and we had data reporters. The data reporters were key in, in, in all of this. This is still primarily a data driven project, which means that you need people who are experienced in what's called CAR, <coughs> computer assisted reporting. You know how to write these lengthy codes that will plug into the database and pop back out information. Um, one of the first stories that we did that took a little bit deeper look was um, a story that we called Outliers, where we took a look at some of the doctors who um, had done, had the, had the most part of their billing from one particular procedure, which isn't necessarily bad. There are a lot of people who specialize, but we found a number of people that the troubling pattern of billing most of their patients for one particular procedure outside of their specialty and outside of what are the modes of medical uh, care. One of the most sort of intriguing ones was a guy named uh, Ronald Weaver, who is an internist in Los Angeles, and he had been billing for uh, a procedure that is known as anest external counterpulsation, EEC. And this procedure is um, very rarely used. It's a cardiac procedure, and he is not a cardiologist. It's designed for patients with severe angina who don't respond to any other treatment. Sort of strap people down to this table and put these big blood pressure cuff sort of things on them, and it squeezes them rhythmically to try to improve circulation. Um, it's very, very rarely used. I can uh, just read a little bit about <clears throat> Dr. Ronald Weaver. The government data show that out of the thousands of cardiology providers who treated Medicare patients in 2012, just 239 billed for the procedure, and they used it on fewer than 5% of their patients on average. The 141 cardiologists at the Cleveland Clinic, renowned for heart care, performed it on just six patients last year. Dr. Weaver's clinic administered it to 99.5% Medicare patients, 615 in all. Billing the federal health insurance program for the elderly and disabled 16,619 times, according to the data. This is just one year of data. And obviously, Dr. Ronald Weaver is an outlier. This is not a normal procedure. And, but we found that there were more than 2,300 providers that earned $500,000 or more in 2012 from just one single procedure. <coughs> Um, and it, looking at finding outliers like this in the data was challenging. Um, you, know, you don't always know, that it's not, it doesn't pop out of the data, you have to know what to look for. We had some very smart reporters who knew how to, how to ask these kinds of questions to the data. We found a number of doctors like this. We found a doctor named Evangelos Geroniotis, Geroniotis, who had $1 million in Medicare for one procedure called cystoscopy. <coughs> Go ahead, I'm going to say it wrong. Cystoscopy and inflammation procedures, where he, um, the burning procedure in, in, in neurology. And Dr. Gary Martyr received 2.41 million from Medicare for a radiation procedure, which only two other doctors built an entire program that year. And he had $2.41 million. And one of the interesting things about doing stories like this is you know, those numbers are pretty eye-popping. And, um, and, but you know, you need more than just the numbers when you're telling a story like this. You need the human story, you need to tell it in a way that draws the readers in. So we talked to these doctors, and the reporters went to their, to their locations. And that really helps bring these stories to life. The, the reporter went to see um, Dr. Weaver's facility. This is the report of what he found when he, when he visited. The clinic resembles a spa, 
In several dark treatment rooms, patients lay on about two dozen beds as the EECP machines emit pumping sounds. Outside vans advertise a free EECP trial pick, picked up and dropped off patients, most of them elderly. Internal emails reviewed by the journal show the staff is instructed to make frequent calls to patients. On September 12, Ms. The, Ms. Zulati, who is his office manager, um, emailed her staff, we have very low numbers today. Please make sure everyone is on the phone all day. One day they were supposed to have 135 patients and only 83 showed up. So she was exhorting them to get their numbers back up above 90. So they were recruiting people to come and get this procedure. And it's not necessarily so that they were harming these patients, but it was, it, they were so about millions of dollars of billing for a procedure that had probably no medical benefit. And Stephen Nissen of the Cleveland Clinic said that EECP is a treatment that is and should be rarely used. So that's where we got a lot of attention, because there's a lot of weird things that people were doing. Um, and one of the things that people ask us a lot about this project is, well, why did Medicare stop this? You know, why, why did they just keep paying for these things? And Medicare does have um, their own staff who looks at the same data and far more of it than we have. And they see patterns too. And they try to do things to change the building. But um, even when they can see it and they can change the rules, try to discourage um, something that seems lucrative, we find often that the doctors who are good at making money off of these things find ways around it. They, they, they change their procedures and they, and they um, um, find a new way to, to, to continue to make money. Um, one of the more interesting ones that we wrote about along those lines was a story about pain doctors. And the, 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 the pain doctors, the, 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 the issue that came up in this story was kind of an ironic uh, result of the crackdown on pain pills. A lot of, a lot of problems with the addiction to opioids and um, federal officials uh, have been recommending that people who want pain pills, the doctors test them regularly to make sure, one, that they are um, taking their meds, one, probably because compliance is important and uh, that's been shown to improve outcomes, but also <coughs> to show that they're taking them and not selling them. But um, they also then recommend testing for other uh, addictive drugs to make sure that they're not <coughs> taking other, um, another, other illicit drugs. Um, and it turns out that the testing for those drugs is very, very lucrative. There was a kind of testing that was done at one point, and I can just read to you how this, how this played out. Medicare <coughs> medical guidelines encourage doctors to treat pain to test their patients to make sure they are neither abusing pills nor failing to take them, possibly to sell them. Now some pain doctors are making more from testing than from treating. Spending on the test took off after Medicare crackdown on what appeared to be abuse of billing for simple urine tests. Some doctors move on to high-tech testing methods for, methods for which billing was seemed limited. They started using tests for a whole bunch <coughs> of different drugs, including illegal ones that few seniors ever use, and billing federal health programs for the elderly and disabled separately for each substance. Medicare spending on 22 high-tech tests for drugs of abuse hit $445 million in 2012, up 1,423% <coughs> in five years. So once that shift happened and, and, and Medicare was do, trying to discourage overuse of these tests, the doctors just turned to a more expensive kind of test called mass spectrometry, spectrometry and were testing patient, every patient who came in the door, and some of them, right? Now, this is, I'm not talking everybody, but some of the outliers had found a way to make a, a very good living testing every senior for wide panels of drugs every time that they needed to be tested. And they were testing them for angel dust, <laughs> Ecstasy, <laughs> something I've never heard of called Molly. Uh -huh. or, uh, it's a, it's a, yeah, I don't think a lot of seniors go to raves. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, they, they, they were getting tested for it. Um, and it, it was very lucrative. Um, in 2012, Medicare paid $14 million to test Medicare beneficiaries for angel dust. Oh, wow. And the, the, we talk, here again, we talked to a doctor who, who found that was the, the, the most ben, you know, financial benefit from this practice. And he was very forthright about it. You know, he said, this is, this is how I pay the bills. Um, yes, you can get more money from testing than you can from pain. And he's a pain doctor, he treats patients, and he felt that he had come up with a sound business strategy, and there's nothing illegal about what he's doing that would help him pay the bills. And he developed a strategy, a, a whole side business doing this, that would also do these tests 
for other doctors. And he found a way to encourage other doctors to send him more tests. And we found literature that he had sent out to other doctors in the area, encouraged them to send their testing to him so that he could do this, this mass spectrometry on testing for angel dust on all of their patients. And the promise that the deal, if they did this and sent their patients, could bring them an extra $96,000 a year to their practices. But the, 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 another aspect, like I said, with the first one, too, is, you know, you don't just look at the data. You have to look at the people and find ways to tell the story. There is always another side to this. And I, he was very forthright. He, he felt strongly that he was doing something that helped kept his practice going. Um, and when he looked at it more closely, he was a bit abashed and thought about it a little bit more and um, said maybe there are some excesses. Um, <laughs> 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 we, we, we talked to a woman named Elaine Jeter, who is the medical director uh, of a Medicare contractor called Palmetto GBA, which you may be familiar with around here because they handle all the Medicare claims processing for um, um, areas of the South, including the Carolinas. And they were aware of this and were trying to crack down on, uh, on some of the testing. So they had, were going to implement a new policy in which firms that routinely do high-tech tests with panels of 40 drugs or more wouldn't be able to bill for each individually, but would rather get a single flat payment. And Dr. Wadley, who was the doctor that we had, um, that had built this whole practice around, his name was um, um, Robert Wadley, he's in Raleigh, North Carolina, um, said he, he supported that, because partly because the other proposals that they had uh, suggested would have been more to come in. But in the end, he said, I think, I think you guys pay too much in Medicare. So um, there's, the stories are not so straightforward that every person in these is, is, a, is an evildoer. Many, many of these doctors that we found in medical practices um, are also trying to do the best they can. And, and many people felt that they were uh, following the best medical judgment, even that they were outliers that were far outside of the common medical practice. And we found a number of people who were practicing medicine in a way that would not um, in, in concert with what is the, the commonly accepted medical practice. But they felt that they knew this was the way I practice. And, uh, if I could make a whole lot of money doing it that way, well, isn't that great? Um, another uh, another story I'll, I'll share a little bit about with you is, uh, uh, you know, as I said, Medicare sometimes can see this and they know when these things are happening, um, and sometimes the doctors find ways around it. That's the best pattern we found. Um, a number of people that we talked to said it was like a game of whack a mole, you know, trying to change the rules in this way, and 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 a lot of the doctors who would. Um, who were doing that, which is find a new way around it. But another thing that comes in the way of uh, Medicare trying to crack down on um, more serious fraud and abuse, and that is politics. Um, we, we found a number of examples of people who were regulators, uh, uh, contractors, former contractors, who said that when they did try to crack down and stop payments to doctors that they thought, um, and hospitals where they thought billing was inappropriate, that local politicians would intervene because a hospital, for instance, is a big employer in any area. And uh, we found one particular example uh, of a hospital in Houston called Houston Riverside General Hospital that um, had been uh, under review by, by investigators at, at CMS, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, and they on something called prepayment review, which basically stopped the payment. They didn't get the payments anymore. Um, and it wasn't long before a local uh, congresswoman representative, Sheila Jackson Lee, uh, contacted Marilyn Tavener, uh, the, who was the administrator of, CM, of Medicare at the time, according to our documents, and said, you, you have to do something about this. And sure enough, weeks later, Mar from Marilyn Tavener directly, came the edict, we got the government's loan payments. Even though Medicare was actively investigating the hospital at the time, she later pretended she did not know. But um, after, after the, the congresswoman intervened and Ms. Tavener restored the payments, um, two months later, Riverside's top executive was indicted on a $158 million fraud scheme. Later, the hospital was barred from Medicare, and the CEO was convicted in October. So while it's, it's, it, 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 the answers aren't easy in these situations. As um, one of our uh, sources told us, this is Ted Doolittle, a former deputy director of the Center for Program Integrity at CMS, which is their anti-fraud unit. He said most legislators support Medicare's effort to fight fraud. But, quote, the member who just lost 150 jobs in her district at the hand of a faceless Washington bureaucrat, she's flippin' livid. <laughs> 
So it, 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 things like that can, can get in the way very frequently of Medicare's efforts. Because I get asked this a lot when I talk about this. How does this happen? Why in the world does Medicare just keep paying for these things that clearly, as your story says, are insane? And the truth is, of course, they're not. It's not quite that simple. But there are, there are a lot of things that can intervene in Medicare trying to, um, to try and cut back on some of this. Um, I don't know how much more time I have to talk or to talk about another um, talk about another story. Um, and I'll, have to, I'll have to be cheesy here. Um, they're also good. <laughs> so this is actually an interesting one, um, again, about how, uh, how doctors uh, can get around some of the restrictions. Um, there are, there are laws and kickbacks and self-referral that are meant to limit doctors' self-dealing to get their money from, from um, either, to, either to pay fees in order to get more business or to um, uh, pay for referrals. And uh, uh, the, the, the law that is um, that governs this is referred to as the Stark Law because it's named after the, uh, uh, Representative Pete Stark, who's Democrat in California. And he, uh, uh, health care that, that law. So you often may have heard of the Stark laws that are um, anti-kickback and anti-self-referral laws. We found um, a very large um, oncology practice in Florida called 21st Century Oncology Holdings that uh, had made a lot of money uh, in Medicare on a, a bladder cancer test that's known as FISH. I can't remember what it stands for. I think it's somewhere. But um, they got the, the law, you're not allowed to pay for a uh, for a, a referral, but you can offer a fee that compensates them somehow for services. So they would pay doctors twenty dollars to pop for a referral, and calling it something else, they were getting around the laws. And even though their internal documents, there were a lot of people questioning this, they kept doing it. And when we talked about this practice with uh, Mr. Stark, who's eighty-two now, he said he probably wouldn't look for the law now because it was so easy to circumvent. And later, this is one of my favorite parts of the story. So he said that when, so Mr. Stark says that when he hears his namesake law mentioned when visiting a doctor, I just look the other way and pretend that I have a lot of cousins. <laughs> <laughs> so these are just a few of the stories that we did, and they were, um, they said they were part of data project, but there was a lot more involved than just data, and that's part of investigative journalism. You can look at the numbers. And that's actually a big movement in investigative journalism right now, finding databases. But there's a lot more to it than that. And that's something I know I talk to journalists about, and we talk about it a lot, that you have to also to tell the human story. And you need to tell the other side of the numbers. The numbers don't tell the whole story. They're only new into it, but they're only part of it. So um, you need what we refer to as 360 reporting. You need to talk to everybody around it and make sure that you've got the right context. And you're talking to every possible person that you can think of that can give you a perspective on it. I have a colleague who likes to say, um, you, do, you make three phone calls, you've got a story. You make that fourth phone call, you lose your story. <laughs> but that's why you make the fourth phone call, and the 15th, and the 20th, and the, I don't know, several hundred that we did. Because um, you want to make sure you get the whole story. And I, I feel proud that we did, that we told the story here that was not just numbers, but it was a very human story about the impact of fraud and abuse on, on, on the system that we're all paying for and we count on to take care of our seniors. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you have yeah. any questions. So this is the Q&A portion. <laughs> these Q's and these A's are really informative. So does anyone have a question you'd like to ask? Do you have plans, or are you expanding the same investigative journalism to Medicaid? Um, not one particular project. We definitely write a lot about Medicaid. Medicaid is a, is a really different animal. It's administered at the state level, so it's not just one big database. That makes it a little harder to do a data-driven project. But we do definitely write about Medicaid as well. But we don't have a specific project right now. Hey, Tom. Thanks. Um, I wanted to preface my question by having us all turn around and look at what you're learning, looking at, which is yeah. <laughs> a beautiful Western North Carolina sunset, um, which I think is actually very fitting because, as you know, we're in the midst of what us journalists call Sunshine Week. Uh, this is the one week a year where we really salute government transparency and openness, 
and the lack thereof, or we can take note of the lack thereof. And uh, it's the one we can hear what I think hardest about the question. And anymore, the question I ask is specifically about the Federal Freedom of Information Act, which I've grown to learn is a kind of living document that changes, that ebbs and flows, the sun goes up, the sun goes down. Um, and I'm wondering from your perspective where we are in the process of having a good FOIA and what, if any, good prospects you see on the horizon for reform and what um, ways it's a pain in the ass for you and your team. Gosh, um, I don't know if I have a long enough view to answer that quite the way you're, you're asking. But uh, I think our experience with it has been has varied considerably by agency. If we talked about this a little earlier, sometimes if, when you're when you're seeking records, um, the relationship with the agent who's in who's in charge of it is important because uh, it can be hard to make clear what you want sometimes. Um, I think in a, at the federal level, uh, it varies considerably by agency. We've had times when uh, <coughs> the information right away quickly and in an easy to access fashion. Um, all the way to, I spent in a FOIA once um, a few years ago, and I took uh, about four years, and I got a registered letter finally saying, oh, we can't find it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I think it varies a lot by agency. Hi. <clears throat> Hi. So you mentioned this data set that you got earlier. You said it was very large. Can you describe that a little bit? How did the, was the format that came in? How large was it? Uh, sure, and I'm not one of the car reporters, the computer system reporters, but um, so it was, uh, uh, as I said, it was um, all of the payments that Medicare made in one particular year, 2012, to all the doctors that bill Medicare. It was over 880,000 doctors. And it comes as like streams of numbers. And you get, when you have a big, big data set, you also get um, like a data dictionary, they say, that they call it, that comes with it. That tells you what all the fields in the big database have names, but you don't know what that what they mean, so then you get a reference dictionary. And uh, this this was this particular one year was 9.2 million records, that's oh. data points. It was it was pretty massive. I mean, we've dealt with actually much more massive databases, but um, it's not something you can put in Excel. <laughs> uh, and there's a database management so, uh, a program called ex a um, Access that uh, was actually to be for that. This had to be in SQL Server. Mm -hmm. So I know that our data reporters had other news outlets climb up and say, it doesn't fit, we can't use it. Well, we, we have to kind of help them out. Um, but once you get into the database and you start organizing, sorting, and collating, figure out what you've got, and they have to index it, uh, 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 the, and I'm parroting a bit here what they tell me because it's not as though I do this part myself, then you have to write queries to, to get the information out of the databases. You write it in something called SQL code, S-E-Q-L, and it's a lot of commands. So I think it's not too wildly dissimilar from HTML. And sort of tell if, if, you, if you see this data point and you see that data point, you put them together and then you compare it to that, and you write long, long sequences of code um, to try to get information out of the database. And if you get it, then boom, you get a chart. <laughs> Sorry. Right. Thank you. That's the short option. Sure. Stephanie, uh, the Pulitzer Committee also takes a look not only at the craft of the reporting, but on the impact. So what was the range of the impact, and how did they assess it? <laughs> well, the, 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 the impact of, of this you know, was, was quite varied. It ran a number of stories. Um, and I, I'm, uh, I can mention a couple of, of uh, people that were in our stories and, and what happened. Sometimes it was things like um, um, efforts at, at Medicare to uh, uh, change one of the aspects of, of billing that we were looking at. One of them, they, they were going to change it. They put it all on hold because once they saw our story, they realized that uh, there was a lot more going on. It was going to be more complicated. They actually, even though they were going in the right direction to try to change it, they put it on hold for review because um, in, in, re in reaction to our story. Um, so a couple of the companies that we mentioned, the one I mentioned at the end, um, um, 21st Century, uh, has uh, uh, struggled a bit since then and um, just settled, uh, just had a settlement. Um, there's a there's a company called Health Diagnostics Laboratory that um, I'm going to story about um, how they uh, uh, were, were using a particular kind of test frequently and paying doctors to to, to refer the lab testing. And uh, after that story, they were already under investigation for other reasons. Um, but they're, uh, they're, they, they ended up out of the bank. They lost a lot of business. 
and um, their CEO resigned, and they um, they are they, they are still in operation, but they they filed for bankruptcy. And you know some of the things that we saw were not <coughs> going really well already, but as they progressed, and we came they came down to, to settlements and, and and some kind of um, some kind of uh, uh, and it, it just it was underscored that we were on the right track. It was a big underscore of what we've been doing. Um, I also, also know there's a story we did about doctors overusing a particular drug called Procrit for cancer patients. It's not really indicated for cancer patients. This is an example of a lot of doctors we found, more oncologists who were using this drug um, outside of the medical practice, and it could be a very lucrative drug to use. And uh, a lot of oncologists later told us that their, their cancer patients came to us and said, I don't want any more Procrit. Don't give me any more Procrit, but change medical practice. Of course, you find the abuses of the system and the money involved, and of course that becomes the focus of the government to see what they can recover. Do you follow up any way as to the amount that they can recover or the user recover when they find an abuse of the system as far as dollars are concerned? Um, yeah, they actually they actually report it, and um, that's it. you can you can find out how much they're able to recover. I can tell you it's not much. Uh, in the, one of the stories that we did about the efforts to recover and claw back in, in proper payments, um, law enforcement was estimating to us that there's about maybe 58 million uh, billion, sorry, a year in fraud and uh, abuse, and they get they can they can recover about two and a half billion of that. So they can't get much back. Follow up to that: How many people went to jail? <laughs> <laughs> Specifically, I don't think I can say that, but uh, you know, there was a famous doctor in the very first day of the database was, uh, was released. He turned out to be the doctor who got the single highest amount for Medicare in that year. He got over twenty million dollars in Medicare in a single year. Uh, so Dr. Solomon Melgan, he's an ophthalmologist in Florida, and he, some of you may have heard his name. He, he was later indicted for health care fraud uh, in his relationship with, Robert, with Senator Robert Menendez in New Jersey. Um, and so he, we did not, we're not the only people who looked at it. So I can't, can't take credit. But it's clear, as, as I said, that the, some of these, um, 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 the closure that we to some, to some of these players, other what we, what we were seeing. Stephanie, as a journalist, I noticed a trend that I've talked about with other uh, colleagues in the field. I'm wondering if it's something you observe or maybe it's something that the Wall Street Journal gets a pass on in dealing with government. Uh, a lot of us have noticed a trend. Uh, say 20 years ago, if we went to somebody in government who had some knowledge that we were seeking, whether it was state level or federal level, they might work for an executive agency, uh, and we asked some questions. Uh, very likely, if that person um, had done anything wrong and didn't have anything to hide, they would be happy to share that information with us. These days, increasingly, that person will, will say something to the effect, I absolutely can't talk to you, you have to go through the flag, uh, through the gatekeeper uh, for that agency. And, uh, and we find many times we never get back to that expert who will probably do the answer. I've had cases where I've called up the person without mentioning who I was, as if I was just a consumer, and got the information that I was seeking when I went back to try to put them on the record. They couldn't talk to me. I couldn't get that same information. Is that something you see? Um, kind of depends on um, where we're looking. Sure. Uh, you know, and the kind of deep we're talking about. In, in, in we cover we cover corporations in our, in my group, the drug companies, the insurance companies, the hospital companies, and it's a mix. Reporters have relationships with sources within the companies and relationships with the public relations people. So it kind of depends on the story, what you're looking for, and what you're doing. Um, you, need to, you need to have a relationship with the company as well so that they, you can work with them. So sometimes you have to go through the yes, public relations people. I think when we dealt with, with CMS, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, it's been pretty much that you go through their uh, comms people, their communications people. So how long did it take you to do this story, and how many reporters and staff were involved in this? So starting in 2009, no, uh, <laughs> in, in uh, 2014. So it took the better part of the year, well, nine months. 
uh, they had been thinking data from CMS from the beginning of the year. They, 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 they gave out this one particular set of doctor payment data which turned out to be extremely valuable uh, in April. And the last, so, so we started in earnest really in April and uh, the last story we ran in the end of December. Um, then we had two <coughs> industry reporters, experts in hospital and health insurance. We had two um, uh, classic investigative reporters without particular health care to receive necessarily, although one of them did. Um, we had two data reporters, and we've had you know all kinds of backup help from other people. And we also have a whole graphics team that put together a big interactive link, and you, you can look at it yourself if, you, if you're interested. Look up your doctor um, uh, that allows you to sort of poke around in the data yourself. And that took a, uh, another whole team. So it was, it's a big crowd. We couldn't send them all to the lunch to pick up the bullets. <laughs> <laughs> For those of us who teach journalism uh, and develop, develop curriculum, uh, what are the specific skills that we should be uh, giving our students for the like, courses we can develop in their terms of curriculum that will enable students to be able to do the kind of investigative journalism that we need and that sort of trickle up? That's the first question. And then the second question is sort of frivolous. In the movie version of the you know, okay, story, who, who do you wish to? <laughs> Wall Street Journal is, is owned by a relatively new owner, Rupert Murdoch. Um, he's a very political individual, supports candidates, opposes candidates, has strong views, he's willing to share. Has, is there any sense of anybody in the newsroom that there are topics you need to be careful of, that you need to not go off the reservation, that there'll be pressure? No. No. Well, you don't care. And the journal, uh, you know, it, even on the, I, don't, I can't speak at all for the editorial side, which is completely separate, as I think probably most people do understand editorial and news are completely separate. Um, but the journal doesn't actually uh, never has endorsed political candidates, so it's not something we've gotten into even on the on the on the uh, opinion side. But no, I haven't felt his touch. Because <laughs> 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 I, I think he's, he, he's respectful of what we do. So I don't know him personally, but he certainly has been hands off. Hi. Uh, do you have any perspective on how the um, level of what you uncovered with Medicare compares with what might be going on with private insurance companies? Oh, that's awfully hard to judge um, because we can't FOIA that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know we hear a lot of complaints about private insurance companies and what they cover. They're much more. They're a pretty regulated industry. Um, I. I, I don't think I could try to quantify that. I would, I would, I would not try to quantify it. Yeah. So what are you working on now? <laughs> <laughs> well, we, um, I can tell you, 
but we didn't go past the past year. Um, we actually had another separate Medicare investigation we did all of last year uh, with many of the same reporters uh, using a completely different data set that was much bigger, much broader. We knew that the, this one year of doctor payment data was 9.2 million. I think the database we used for this past year was tens of times more than that. It was, very, you know, it was, it, it, it was, it was um, uh, looking not just for doctors and not just in one year, but over a series of years and um, at the hospitals, the skilled nursing facilities, which are known as SNFs. Um, and that's, that's what we call the calculated care looked at uh, not just like outliers and doctors, who, individuals who were working outside of the bounds of what might be considered norm, but, but how entire systems work in a way to maximize billing without necessarily medical benefit to patients. And we had a number of great stories last year on that. We also did a series on drug prices, which has been a topic a bit in the news. Um, and we were a part of the drug pricing stories that we did. Any other questions? Did the uh, data indicate any concentration in a particular state or region of the country? You know, we, the, the variations, that, which I think is, is pretty well known, um, that there's a lot of variation locally. We were trying to look at some of the ways that various communities might reflect certain, it, we, we weren't able to do a regional kind of story the way we wanted to, with certain limitations to data, one of which is that we only had one year of it. We couldn't track change over time. Um, but there's definitely a significant variation around the country in, 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 in who does what. And that wasn't one of the stories we wound up doing, actually. Since there's the public disclosure of the names of the medical providers, and therefore it became public as to the amount of money that many of them were getting, did that have an effect as far as perhaps having them to look, re-examine their billing so that they weren't quite in the news and took the spotlight off of perhaps your organization that they weren't getting a lot of money and therefore they might have been committing some kind of fraud? Well, some of the doctors that we spoke with did, you know, express surprise that they stood out in billing. They, they were very surprised. <laughs> 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 Practicing medicine in the way that they felt. We had one, one of the doctors who, uh, um, in the next year, turned out to be the biggest biller, um, getting over over 20 million for one one doctor. But she uh, treats a lot of hemophiliacs, and uh, in certain specialties, oncology is one of them. And you treat hemophiliacs. The the drugs that you administer, you you, you have to buy up front, and then you get reimbursed. So. Baked into that is the amount of money you're spending on the drugs that you then give to the patients. And hemophilia drugs are very, very, very expensive. So she was of out, she was an outlier because she's spending a lot of money on the drugs for the patients. Um, and so she was surprised, uh, but it's not as though she changed her practice. Um, we, we actually had a real a lot of very positive response from doctors to the stories. And while a lot of while the American Medical Association had opposed the, the, the release of the doctor's names, I think in the end the general feeling was it wasn't so bad. A lot of doctors told us that they like looking up themselves and their friends in the database, and, 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 and we all know about it. Look, I'm, I'm, I'm within the, I'm, I am normal. And it's, um, good because, of course, most doctors are practicing medicine in a sound, thoughtful way. And, and we, and we're not embarrassed to have that information out there. Stephanie, I wanted to follow on that great question about journalism students of today. Because obviously our profession is in a huge uh, tidal wave of change. I know a lot of young journalists who are coming out of schools now. They're, they're incredibly nimble and uh, multifaceted in their skills. They can tweet, they can storify, they can shoot video, they can edit it. But there's an overwhelming pressure on them to be brief, uh, to, to write in the age of the listicle, uh, to get the clicks. I'm wondering to what degree those pressures affect uh, your work or might come to bear on you and your reporters. Oh, sure. Um, um, we have the, the, the thing I always tell the reporters is you have to do it all. You have to do the 2,000 word story that you work on for months that goes on page one, and you have to write a blog post, and you have to write a tweet, and you have to write um, little, little, little listicle things that can go on social media. We have to do everything. We have, we have to find ways to reach readers on all platforms. And, um, one of the biggest ways that, that, that people are consuming media now is on the 
phones, this little tiny thing in their hands. And it's hard to reach a thousand word story in, your, in the palm of your hand. So we have to find ways to reach people who do that as well. And it's, it's, it is definitely a challenge. Uh, about, I think something like half our readership is digital now, and about half of that is from mobile, and it's growing. That's the fastest growing area. Mm -hmm. um, so it is an enormous challenge to try to do it all. Um, and there are trade-offs. There are different strategies to do it. You can have some people that concentrate more on social and short things, and you can have some people that concentrate on the long term. And we have a, we have people who focus at the extreme ends of that. But I think most of the reporters are kind of somewhere in the middle, trying to do it all just every day. Any other questions? Thank you, Stephanie. Oh, so